You want to know how he's choosing them, don't you? These attacks were highly organized. The women carefully chosen. This wasn't some killing frenzy. He was never out of control. This is like Silence of the Lambs. This is a psychological thriller. My dear Dr. Lecter, I wanted to tell you I'm delighted that you've taken an interest in me. I don't believe you tell them who I am. The important thing is what I am becoming. The tension in it is very much to do with psychological gamesmanship. This is a very shy boy, Well, Have you considered the possibility that he is disfigured or that he may believe he is disfigured? The mythology of the story and the mythology of the characters. I'm going to bring it back to where it began. So you'll be wanting lots of these little chinwags, I take it. I might not have time. I do. I have oodles. Picture's off. Boom. Hey, camera mark. Be mark. Here we go. Roll out. Ready. On. Action. Universal Pictures presents a remarkable cast telling the story that started it all. FBI! Francis Delahaye, where is he? Red Dragon. Okay, yeah, like that, that's great. From director Brett Ratner and Academy Award-winning writer of The Silence of the Lambs, Ted Talley, comes the first and most terrifying chapter in the Hannibal Lecter trilogy. Good cut! Go behind the scenes as Anthony Hopkins reprises his Oscar-winning role. Joined by Edward Norton, Ray Fiennes, Harvey Keitel, Emily Watson, Mary Louise Parker, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Rehearsal for camera. All right. Ready? Here we go. I can yeah. come in and stop. Action. In Red Dragon, Edward Norton plays the man who caught Hannibal stop. Lecter, stop. FBI profiler Will Graham as he is lured out of retirement to catch an even more dangerous serial killer. This freak killed the Jacobis in Birmingham on Saturday night, February 25th. I think we have a better chance to catch him fast if you help. The story is very much about how this guy who's left this work gets, gets pulled sort of step by step into exactly the kind of danger that he's told himself he doesn't want to get involved in anymore. You're paid up, Will. All of us. Even Josh. There's a chance that I could help them save some lives. How do I say no to that? She doesn't really have a choice because it's something that he needs to do, he needs to do for himself, and that he feels a, like a moral obligation to do, and so there's, she can't really stand in his way. He went through hell and back in his first time at this job, and he kind of escaped from reality and moved down to the Florida Keys. And his boss is saying to him, you know what, get back on the horse and do this. And I understand that you don't like this, but you have a special talent, and we basically need you. He's got a gift for a certain sort of psychological component of the work they're doing, the profiling and things like that, and literally the ability to understand what thrill is the killer getting out of it, what is the, what's the emotional thrill for him in the crime. You took your gloves off, you touched her with your bare hand, and then you wiped her down. But when the gloves were off, did you open her eyes? The character that my character is chasing is this killer that calls himself the Red Dragon. He is obsessed with this painting by William Blake called Red Dragon. And he feels he is transforming into this Red Dragon, into this beast. And every time he kills a family, it's making him stronger. He doesn't like being weak. He doesn't like being vulnerable. When you play a part like this, you try to get inside the head of that person, see the world from their point of view. They're difficult scenes because they demand a kind of ra ratcheting up of in emotional intensity and, uh, and psychosis, which, you know, I'm trying to engage with something that's actually quite upsetting. I don't think anybody knows you at all, Dee. Everybody wonders about you, though, especially the women. Reba kind of is attracted to him because she sees him as a kind of a kindred spirit in some way, because he has a disability. Um, you know, she knows that he's very sensitive about it. I can hear that you've had some kind of soft palate repair, but I understand you fine because you speak very well. 
I know what it's like to have people always thinking that you're different. The reason why Dollar Hyde falls for Reba is because of the fact that she's blind and he thinks that she's, she's not judging him. She can't see how ugly he really feels. To her, he's this shy, silent presence. I think she's trying to make him feel more relaxed and confident. The audience knows that he's something else. So she's very forward with him, very, you know, quite brazen. And uh, unfortunately for Reba, she's just been misreading all these signals and in fact, he's a serial killer. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's a bit of a shame, really, when you decide to be a sexual predator and your first victim is a serial killer. Oh, he's torn. He's torn, absolutely. There's something this girl offers him that he's not... He can't articulate it to himself emotionally or rationally, but there's something about the way she engages with him that, that wrong-foots him. You do get the sense that there is some very genuine feeling there between them, and he is, he is trying to stop because of her. He's upstairs. He, he wants you, Reba. I thought he was gone, but now he's back. Do you really understand Francis Dollar Hyde's history? You understand his torment, his insecurities, but it's really in his head. He thinks the Red Dragon is speaking to him, so it's some scary stuff. You're hurting me! No, you can't have her! It's all over for me.